Needs to be okay. Okay. All right. Good. <laughs> so your last time you you managed very well multitasking, but we will have an eye on the chat and the raise hands. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Let's uh, start again. So. Um, Let's welcome our third speaker today, uh, Claudio Castelnovo from Cambridge University. So Claudio gave a fantastic lecture last week uh, on quasi-particles and uh, in frustrated magnets. And this was certainly one of the most, if not the most uh, interactive lecture so far. And uh, yeah, let's, let's try to make it a, a similar experience today and ask him lots of questions. Um, yeah, who, for those who, who missed uh, the introduction um, last week, let me briefly introduce Claudio. So uh, he, he completed his undergraduate studies in Milano uh, and then moved to, to Boston for a PhD, which he uh, completed in 2006. After that, he moved uh, to the UK, to Oxford University, where he held an EPSRC postdoctoral fellowship and he was awarded um, uh, a lectureship position at Royal Holloway in 2010. But then in 2012, he moved to uh, Cambridge University where he is now a reader in theoretical condensed matter physics. So Claudio's research inter interests are very wide ranging, including emergent and out of equilibrium phenomena in strongly correlated many body systems. Um, also glassiness and disordered systems, fractionalization of order parameters and excitations, topological order and further field quantum information and uh, even quantum computation. So Claudio is of course very well known for his important contributions in the field of frustrated magnetism and in particular the prediction of magnetic monopoles in spin eyes. Today, he will talk about uh, the dynamics and uh, localization in spin liquids. Thank you very much, Frank, for the very kind introduction. Um, and uh, thanks to all organizers uh, for this opportunity. Um, today's talk, um, first of all, is the first time I actually uh, delivered. I've just put it together for this uh, conference, so bear with me if it will not be as smooth as it could be. Um, it's actually an overall, overall structure in, in an attempt to put into a coherent perspective um, a few bodies of work that are um, in, presented in these four archive papers. Some of them are published, some of them are not, but I gave the archive links and I give them throughout the talk for, sim for simplicity. Um, as it often happens in physics, a few physical intuitions lead to um, several strands of research that are somewhat related and then later on a, a coherent pitch, picture emerges and then hopefully maybe further down the line even a, a generalized framework for this. But that's, that's what this talk is going to attempt uh, to do and for this reason it was done uh, with a broad range of collaborators that I want to start uh, first and foremost by acknowledging. Um, I have, a, of course, my uh, dear friend and long-standing collaborator, Roderick Musner, uh, who has been uh, on and off in contact with most of uh, the things that I'll be uh, discussing uh, today. And also, uh, Yuan Wan in Beijing, uh, Sarang Gopalakrishnan and Vadim Oganisian uh, in Cuny in New York. Matthew Stern uh, was a brilliant undergraduate student who did some of the work in one of these projects uh, from Stony Brook. And then uh, my group in Cambridge, um, Tom Gray, who actually does not feature in the publications, but I would like to thank him dearly for uh, a lot of uh, discussions uh, and interactions that we had. Um, my postdoc, uh, Giuseppe De Tomasi, uh, recently, about a year ago, joined Cambridge. And then I underlined um, Oli Hart, who has uh, been a graduate student uh, with me since 2016, and he is underpinning uh, three of the four pieces of work that I'll be talking about today. And he really deserves um, much of the credit uh, both for its, his exquisite uh, technical abilities, both analytically and numerically, and, and his deep physical intuition. So he really did an impressive amount of work, and I will be putting it into a coherent perspective, but I hope I won't be taking the credit for actually the work that he has uh, truly uh, outstandingly done. Um, 
I will try to keep this uh, talk as self-contained as possible, um, but uh, those of you who listened to the introductory one next, last week uh, will hopefully find it easier to follow. Um, and I'll try to make my best to bring everybody else up to speed. Um, this talk is about uh, spin liquids um, and um, specifically a class of spin liquids um, which may not be all of them, but um, encompasses many examples as well as um, candidate um, Hamiltonian for real materials, um, where we can think of the spin liquid behavior coming from um, some uh, constrained set of configurations that are classically degenerate, and then quantum fluctuations on top that create superposition and, and, and uh, um, quantum dynamics on top of this. Um, and in these type of uh, systems, typically, you can understand the physics of these spin states as um, pictorially, as, as, a, as an effective description in terms of a vacuum out of which uh, elementary quasi-particle excitations are born and they can annihilate back into the vacuum. Uh, and there is a close interplay between the physics and properties of these excitations and the vacuum that hosts them. Um, specifically, we will be looking at a finite temperature window in this system, which is the novelty and of, of uh, that, that is the underlying thread of all these uh, uh, four um, pieces of work. Um, the idea is that we're looking at um, quantum spin liquids that have been uh, studied for a long time uh, with special focus at their low temperature, actually typically zero temperature properties and their exotic excitations that many of you are familiar with. And instead we, instead of looking at zero temperature, we were looking at an intermediate temperature regime, temperature regime where we can model them uh, as part classical, part quantum. There will have to be some coherent component, but we cannot treat them as fully coherent zero temperature systems. Uh, there are two points um, for which uh, we think this approach is interesting, and I will try to make the case as I go through my talk. Um, on the one hand, if we're looking for quantum spin liquids candidates, as we are coming now, or the field is becoming mature, to actually search for real materials. There are lots of candidates, um, some of which are very close to being definitive confirmations, but not quite there yet. We, of course, are in dire need of um, more and more um, experimentally available techniques to diagnose and characterize um, these uh, uh, quantum spin liquids. And as reaching very low temperature is both experimentally challenging and costly. Of course, the more we can find precursor at intermediate temperatures of the expected quantum spin liquid behavior at low temperature, uh, the better position we will be in um, to actually uh, uh, study these, these, these systems from uh, an experimental uh, or materials point of view. Um, moreover, uh, in studying this material, this um, finite temperature regime, I will try to show you and make the case that it's actually very interesting in its own right. And um, the fact that you have this part classical, part quantum um, behavior uh, will uh, produce what goes under the name of disorder-free localization, um, because you start with a system that is non-disordered, but having a part of it that behaves classically acts as a disorder for the remaining part of the system that is quantum mechanical, and I'll explain what I mean in these terms. I appreciate that at this point in time, they may sound very confusing. Um, this emergent or uh, self-generated disorder uh, in will induce localization, will induce uh, fractal wave functions, scar states, and there will be an interesting phenomenon of phase separation due to the mutual statistics between the quasi-particles, et cetera. A very rich phenomenology that we are just about starting to study. Uh, um, in uh, these times. These are early, early days for this finite temperature uh, regime. It is a very challenging one. If we take it face value, we're talking about um, quantum mechanics essentially of an open system or partly mixed state uh, and typically studying both thermodynamic and dynamical properties for a many body two dimensional or higher system difficult questions to answer. The best we can do is look at, at the moment, toy models and maybe even more simplified approximate effective descriptions. And this will be indeed uh, the core of the talk. I will start uh, with a brief generic introduction on a couple of slides, but then I will focus in on two specific um, classes of models. One is inspired by the eight vertex model, also known as the Tory code, 
Um, and the other one is inspired by the six vertex model, which equivalently can be uh, related to quantum square eyes, quantum spin eyes in two dimensions. Um, I will try to give specific results about these models uh, while presenting a coherent picture of this finite temperature regime and, and um, its phenomenology. And of course, one of the open questions which will remain open at the end of the talk is whether we can go from a simple coherent picture of a, a few disparate projects, perhaps one day to a generalized framework um, to studying this class at least of quantum spin liquids at finite temperature. And I will come to that uh, back again in the conclusions of the talk. Now, this is the first time I give the talk. I will try to start at a reasonable pace because it's important that as many people as possible follow through. I will probably need to pick up the pace a little bit, um, but I want to make sure very much again in the spirit of condensed matter physics in the city that this remains as much as possible even by a Zoom an interactive talk. I am quite sure that some of the things I will say will be not so clear, not so polished, um, perhaps complicated. And I, I would very much welcome to be interrupted with questions so that we can uh, deliver uh, or communicate as best as we can and deliver as much knowledge. Um, there are two cores of the talk, as I said, the eight vertex, six vertex model. I'm perfectly happy to drop one of the two and focus on the other to keep the time, but then have people understand and follow what I say rather than cram in eight and six together and, and lose everybody in the process. So please help me as we go along in trying to keep this uh, talk as, as effective uh, uh, as possible for everyone uh, involved. Okay, so just two slides of generic introduction. Uh, for those of you uh, who attended my talk last week, um, these will be quite natural. They follow from that introduction. For others, maybe they will uh, uh, read a little bit um, uh, cryptic uh, because uh, they are worded in a rather generic language. Please bear with me if this doesn't resonate very much. In three slides, I'll start with a specific model where we'll have Hamiltonian and a lattice and degrees of freedom. And so all of these words will make sense then if they don't make sense already now. So just for these two couple of slides, uh, just hold this belief and follow um, the generic principle. Um, I want to focus on quantum spin liquids of a specific class. Uh, a class that probably doesn't encompass all quantum spin liquids out there, but does cover quite a few models that we are interested in, as well as realistic Hamiltonians uh, uh, for candidate spin liquid materials. And the key feature um, that I think about these um, quantum spin liquid systems is to have a Hamiltonian H uh, that can be at least on an effective level decomposed into a leading order term, which is a classical projector projection term, which I call H capital delta, um, which selects uh, out of the classical set of configurations a um, subset, which is nonetheless extensive and degenerate. And then everything else in the Hamiltonian, you can literally de define H little delta as the full Hamiltonian minus H capital delta if you want. Um, everything else that contains possible interaction terms, further interaction terms, quantum fluctuations, etc typically terms that don't commute with the projection, which was classical and therefore caused the system to have uh, quantum superposition states. Um, we will neglect uh, for simplicity interactions and focus on the quantum terms as uh, kinetic inducing fluctuations. Um, this will be much clearer once we start talking explicitly about operators uh, at this point in time is just a, a, um, a phenomenological statement. Uh, or generic statement. Um, but typically what you expect is that if you introduce um, a term that allows fluctu quantum fluctuations in a system, this term will try to uh, introduce dynamics in the low energy degrees of freedom. So if you have a ferromagnet, for instance, fluctuations, quantum fluctuations will try to move the domain wall because moving a domain wall can be a low energy move, whereas creating or annihilating a domain actually costs energy. In this case, because we're talking about spill liquids, the typical scenario is that you have quasi-particle excitations that are point-like, and so the fluctuation makes these particles hop uh, to leading order. And um, so we will refer to these quantum fluctuations by having a, a um, strength H. Um, I, will, I 
I used t in my earlier uh, talk. I will use h here because I'll use little t for time. Um, to leading order, h will cause uh, dynamics, so it will give a band uh, dispersion to the excitations. If you are in the ground state and you have no excitations whatsoever, uh, this h cannot act to first order, but it still has the ability to act uh, and introduce quantum fluctuations in a ring ex exchange fashion, uh, creating two quasi particles, moving them around a, a finite patch of area, annihilating them again, that kind of spirit that you have in mind that is pictorially drawn uh, uh, in this slide. And that will come with an amplitude delta bar, uh, which is the corresponding perturbative term uh, um, in the generated uh, by uh, the hopping H. And uh, if you have N steps in your ring exchange, that typically is H times H over delta to the N. I'm strictly speaking N minus one, but at the level of this slide, it doesn't make a difference. Um, if you combine this, then we look, can look at the temperature axis for this type of systems and we place all of these um, uh, energy scales and we have the dominant one, which is capital delta, the projective. Above it, it's a disordered paramagnet. Temperature is the winning energy scale. Below it, we place H, um, the dynamics for the excitations. If it were larger than capital delta, you probably wouldn't have a, a spin liquid to begin with. And the intermediate temperature window between little H and capital delta uh, is where you expect essentially classical spin liquid behavior because the quantum uh, um, dynamics, quantum coherence induced by H is spoiled by temperature being larger than H at, at a generic uh, um, assumption. And then we have a decently large gap to the next energy scale, which is delta bar. It's perturbative uh, in H over delta and therefore much smaller than H itself. Um, and finally, at low temperature below delta bar, we have all the way to zero, what we typically study as a quantum spin liquid behavior. The focus of this talk is this intermediate window between delta bar and H, um, where you have to include some quantum mechanics in your system because um, temperature is smaller than H. And so you ought to uh, consider, for instance, the dynamics of excitations to be coherent, at least on some length scale and time scales. On the other hand, temperature is much larger than delta bar, which was inducing the quantum spin liquid, the full quantum spin liquid behavior. And therefore, you're not quite allowed to consider the system as fully coherent zero temperature state. Um, well, yeah, there is a question in the, in the chat from uh, mm -hmm. Victor Don Touchet. I just saw, I, I was getting to a point so I could stop. What is the phenomenological difference between classical spin liquids and quantum spin liquids? Um, there are several, but for instance, quantum spin liquids, uh, uh, one thing we'll see in a moment, they, have, they can exhibit um, non-trivial statistics. Well, of course, if you're a classical spin liquid, the notion of statistics doesn't exist. Um, so that's for, as an example, I mean, you can move around the excitations in a quantum state and then do operations on the wave function. Uh, classically, this is a very different beast because you're not, you don't have braiding of anions or anything like that. So this is as an example. Um, there, there, there are a few others, but um, let me know if this is sufficient to answer your question. And if, if not, perfect, okay. Um, I can elaborate more later if you want. Um, so we have this question mark regime. Uh, one has to devise a description that is between classical and quantum. Um, it's, as I said earlier, it's the highest temperature where one can expect any precursors of quantum spin liquid behavior. Um, higher temperatures higher than H, and then you expect truly to have classical uh, spin liquid behavior, all coherence wiped out, therefore all um, dual quasi particles, all anionic statistics, all is gone. Um, and this precursor to quantum spin liquid behavior, as I said, is potentially important to experiments just to drive home again the same point I said a moment ago. Um, and in general, um, we have this interesting property where some degrees of freedom are essentially thermally excited and incoherent, and they will act as self-generated disorder for, with respect to other degrees of freedom that are instead behaving coherently. And this leave, it gives rise to quite um, some interesting uh, um, uh, properties that will be indeed um, what we will come to uh, uncover as we go through the um, work we have done and the results we, we were able to obtain. At the moment, we only have a, a few interesting case studies and um, maybe a, 
hope for a coherent picture thereof, and the general framework is maybe uh, what would be interesting to aim for um, in the longer run. Okay, um, so that was very brief to give a qualitative uh, perspective um, without any equations. So I hope it um, gave some motivation, but let's put some uh, meat on the table and see uh, a bit more closely what I'm talking about and what I mean by all of these terms that I um, uh, introduced in the previous couple of slides. Um, and to do that, I want to start with the quantum eight vertex model, or for those of you who are familiar, you can think about the toric code in a field. The two are essentially one and the same. Um, I have spin a half degrees of freedom on the bonds of a square lattice. And I start by introducing the largest energy term in the Hamiltonian, H delta, um, which is a term that tries to force the product of the sigma z components of the spins around every site or star in the uh, lattice to be plus one. So we have minus capital delta. I should have written it by capital delta intended to be positive. Some of the stars of the product along the star of sigma i z. And then we turn on a simple transverse field, um, x direction for simplicity in this case. What you can see is that if every star is uh, um, has a product uh, which is plus one, then you cannot flip a spin for free because if you do, you will violate the minimal energy condition in H delta. And so if little h is smaller than delta, um, you will only be able to act perturbatively in the ground state unless you have excitations present. If you act perturbatively in the ground state, um, I would leave it as an exercise. Uh, if you want to try or if you're familiar with the uh, toric code, it will be absolutely obvious. Um, the first thing you can do in perturbation theory is to actually flip uh, the four sigma z components of the spins around a plaquette. Say plaquette P, you flip all of these four spins and then you quickly realize if you check that the minimal ener energy condition for H delta is uh, satisfied. And therefore this generates in perturbation theory, this term H delta bar, uh, where the energy delta bar is the perturbative energy of this ring exchange process and it's H to the fourth over delta cube. And the operation that flips the sigma z components for the four spins is just the product of the four sigma x uh, components of the same spins. And then we see the typical structure of a toric code Hamiltonian. For those of you who are familiar, we have the star terms, which are the product of sigma z components, and the plaquette terms that are the product of the sigma x components of the uh, spin a half or Pauli matrices. If we took only H delta and H delta bar, we actually end up strictly with the toric code. Uh, and the two terms favor, um, well, the first one is the one I just said, the product of sigma z to be plus one. The second one, we clearly see that um, favors the product of the sigma x components to be plus one. But the beauty of this model, which was um, originally proposed and discussed uh, uh, by Kitaev, um, is that these terms commute. And so even though sigma x and sigma z trivially don't, and when you, they both appear in the Hamiltonian, one has to be careful about how to understand the behavior of the system. These products actually commute on the lattice. And if they commute, you can simultaneously minimize them, obviously to simultaneously satisfy them. And so we can talk immediately about excitations in the two languages separately. Before we do that, however, let's look at the excitations in the um, uh, H capital delta on alone uh, by looking at what happens um, to their excitations if we switch on a transverse field starting from a tensor product sigma z state. So this is clearly not an eigenstate in any meaningful way of this uh, combined Hamiltonian, um, but it would be a, 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 an eigenstate of H capital delta, and then you turn on the field. So these are plus and minuses on the lattice. They are the sigma z components of the spins, and um, they're all, all the vertices are in the minimal energy condition of product of them to be plus one. And then we can think of the action of an H field, say on the spin circled uh, in yellow uh, to flip it. And if you flip that, what you end up is two uh, stars that now have the product of the sigma z components to be minus one. These are two defects. The moment you have two defects, uh, you immediately realize that now I can flip spins around these defects, whichever ones I want, and what I end up, say, take the one circled in yellow now, 
I end up moving my defect from one side to the other, uh, healing the, uh, the vertex in the middle. Um, anything that costs energy in this uh, picture is represented by black dots. Everything else is in the ground state. Therefore, you see that as you flip one, one, sorry, you flip one or two spins, the excitation remains the same. And if you keep going flipping spins, again, the energy is still the same. So you can separate these two defects at no energy cost. They are trivially deconfined. And so the elementary excitation in the system is really a single defect, defective site. And you can imagine that the action of a transverse field is essentially to introduce a tight binding amplitude for these defects to move around the system. There is a further complication if you want the full picture because these defects can be created and annihilated out of the vacuum. And that's, uh, uh, of course, in addition to a typical tight binding model. Uh, but if, for instance, at, at low um, defect density, you would be thinking about them purely as a tight binding problem that is completely uh, uniform across the lattice. And in fact, you can map the system to tight binding at low energies uh, quite uh, neatly. This is a, a, um, a description that is semi-classical, if you want, because I've uh, discussed this motion in a specific tensor product sigma z state, which is an, an unrealistic state from the point of view of the Hamiltonian. The moment we introduce h delta bar, um, the system gets all coherent and more complicated. But the elementary excitations remain quite clear, thanks to um, the commuting uh, properties of these uh, uh, plaquette and star terms. Um, I will call from now on the star defect spinons simply because it saves me time uh, and uh, um, they are conventionally referred to as that. Um, so spinons will be any star that has the product of sigma z to be minus one and they cost capital en energy capital delta. And then I have plaquette defects, I will call them visons, and they are the product of the sigma x component around the plaquette being minus one and they have the cost delta bar. Other than this, they are deconfined uh, non-interacting terms, so they are particularly trivial. There is only one special feature about this very simple model, which betrays its topological underpinning nature, even though any other property is essentially a paramagnet. So it's as boring as it gets, except it's as topological, and this topology is reflected in the fact that the two type of excitations, spinons and bisons, are mutually semionic. What I mean by that, if, if you have a cat state with a spin on S and a plaquette P uh, excitation, so a spin on S and a, and a vis on P, uh, and you take the spin on, move it around the vis on and come back to its original place, uh, the wave function picks up a minus sign. It behaves like half a fermion, if you want, and the name semion. Um, if you wanted to see well, how this comes about, it's actually fairly um, straightforward. If you want to think about it, imagine that you have a, a, a spin on sitting on the lower left of the black dots um, uh, in the figures at the bottom and you move it to the top right uh, position. Uh, and you can choose to do that along many different paths. And I showed two of them uh, by the yellow uh, lines in the figure. Moving a spin on means applying the field H multiple times along the path for every edge that you are crossing. Um, and the two paths here clearly differ by the edges of the plaquette P. Remember that sigma x spins square to one, so you can change one path to the other by multiplying by the four sigma x of spin operators around the plaquette P. And now you can clearly see the semionic statistics. If P hosts a vison, the product of those four sigma z is a minus one, and therefore moving the spin on along the path on the left has to come with a minus sign compared to moving the spin on uh, with the path on the right hand side. You're welcome to try the um, uh, paper and pen calculation if you like. Uh, um, but I hope this gives you uh, a, a flavor of why the semiotic statistics comes about. Um, so to recap, um, back on, the, uh, on track with respect to what we wanted to study in this talk, uh, if we look at the temperature axis for these systems, we have these uh, three energy scales, delta H and delta bar, and the intermediate regime between delta bar and H is the one we want to look at. We have temperatures smaller than the hopping amplitude uh, for the spinons, and therefore we ought to include some level of uh, coherence in the hopping of the spinons. 
On the other hand, the visons, well, temperature is larger than their own energy scale, so they are thermally populated. If they have quantum dynamics, it will be, be an, at an energy scale also lower than delta bar, so temperature larger than that, we expect dense and incoherent or stochastic dynamics uh, for them. And it's the interplay of these two that we want to understand. And thanks to the semionic statistics, there is a very interesting mapping uh, that we can draw, an analogy. Um, because um, every time a spinon goes around a vison, picks up a minus sign, this is the same behavior as a charged particle hopping around a pi magnetic flux. Uh, and so we have a mapping of this incoherent superposition of visons with coherent spinon hopping to a tight binding model of charges in a random pi flux background. Naively, the first thing that comes to mind if people think about this is Anderson localization. Um, if you have pi flux, static pi flux background and tight binding over it, you have an Anderson localized model, all energy level, all energy eigenstates are localized with a um, pathological divergence at zero energy that is um, in some sense um, uh, reasonably understood. The physics here is however slightly different because the pi fluxes are not background disorder that is static, they are degrees of freedom that are part of the system. Uh, pi fluxes are degrees of freedom as much as the spinons. What difference, what, what, uh, the difference between them is essentially how coherent versus stochastic uh, their motion uh, ought to be uh, uh, modeled. Uh, and this leads to a very important uh, difference. So we have this self-generated disorder that has in principle some dynamics of its own and uh, needs to be uh, accounted for. So we have Anderson localization of these emergent particles and we will see that the response of the pi fluxes themselves will lead to actually uh, some uh, interesting thermodynamic phase separation due to the semionic statistics. But these are buzzwords that I'm getting ahead of myself. We actually are gonna come to that physics uh, in, in some level of details and I hope I'll, I'll be able to show you what I mean and, and why I'm excited about it. First thing, however, if we want to go beyond this uh, pictorial slide, we need to discuss time scales. That's the difference between uh, charges in a random pi flux background and this system where the, where the pi fluxes are quasi particles themselves, uh, uh, part of the degrees of freedom of the system. Um, and from this, we can take... Um, There's a couple um, of questions in the chat on the last slide, maybe. Ah, oops, okay. Sorry, they didn't update me until now. Um, for Oppinger's Visons, yes. Um, I, I'm, I, don't, I don't allow for Hopping of Visons um, because this talk is an hour long. Um, I actually, the papers discuss Hopping of Visons and I should have discussed it as well, but it would have taken me like another five minutes and I didn't want to stray. Uh, the point is that in order to have a... Um, um, uh, quantum spin liquid at zero temperature, the uh, hopping of visons would have to sit in this energy range between zero and delta bar. In sense that their hopping should be smaller than their own energy, energy scale. Otherwise they condense most likely. So the, the physics could be driven away from a quantum spin liquid phase. Roughly, I mean, that's a, just a generic expectation. Um, it would sit here. And so temperature is larger than delta bar and larger than the hopping of the visons. Actually, the only thing that we really care about is that temperature is larger than the hopping of the visons so that the visons are essentially stochastically moving because we expect temperature to essentially decohere them after every single hop. It's the typical picture where you expect quantum tunneling regime of uh, spins, but temperature is high enough that uh, multi-spin events are never coherent. So that addresses the hopping of the visons. There's nothing protecting them. It's just that it's low and temperature wipes it out. As a matter of fact, I'll, I'll mention it in one second in this slide. Uh, Claudio, following up, follow up on this. Um, yeah. So it's not true that the, the Hamiltonian with H delta and H delta bar only is self dual and you can interchange the role of spinons and visons. If you go no. to the dual lattice, isn't it the case that the spinons turn into the visons and vice versa? Uh, yes, so there is a self-duality um, and we would have to put in uh, something that hops the visons, so it would be a, trans, a, a sigma z field as well, then we have a full self-duality of this model. Um, what matters, I don't, I don't, the name of spin on visors is completely immaterial, 
what matters is that one species is dominant in energy, the other one is subleading by a large margin. Their respective hopping terms have to be smaller than their chemical potentials. So what you have to have, uh, I should have maybe added it here, you have to have H prime for the Vison smaller than delta bar and H smaller than delta. Then if you want to swap delta bar and H, I'm perfectly fine, and you swap also the role of H and H prime, Delta bar and delta and H and H prime, it's fine. That doesn't matter. The self-duality is fine. It's the separation of energy scale that is crucial to the discussion. Um, so indeed, I, that's what I was trying to uh, explain here. We have a spin on time scales. And well, if you have a tunneling amplitude or hopping amplitude H, you typically expect a characteristic time scale one over H. And then the question is, what's the characteristic time scales of the Vison motion? And here, it's a bit more hand waving. If uh, um, they really don't have any hopping, then you could imagine that one over temperature, roughly speaking, gives uh, their stochastic dynamic time scale. It's not a very solid argument, but approximately. And one over temperature, because of the window, is much larger than one over H. If the visons themselves have a hopping amplitude, H prime, then one over H prime would, have, would be their time scale. But one over H prime, well, H prime has to live below delta bar in order to have a quantum spin liquid. So one over H prime is above one over delta bar, which is much larger than one over H. Either way, we have these visons that are particularly slow. And that's the key point. We have visons that are much slower than spinons, and these allow us uh, to make two reasonable working assumption. Um, reasonable, well, the reason being that if we want to face tackle the problem face value, even in the simple setting of a toric code, it's a nightmare. It's 2D, strictly speaking, strongly correlated. And you're talking about um, sort of finite temperature dynamics for a quantum many body system. Uh, so not many techniques that we can deploy other than brute force CD on a relatively small system size. And if we want to make a bit more understanding, especially at the intuitive level, we want to be able to, to delve into some uh, effective descriptions. And we can exploit, or at least what we did is to try and exploit the separation of time scales to propose uh, some effective models that maybe tell us a bit about how um, the systems behave. Um, so the first assumption would be the br most brutal one. Uh, let's look at the, vi uh, let's consider the visons to be static. We're going back to essentially a charge hopping in a fixed uh, pi flux background. Of course, this is going to be valued for some short or up to intermediate time and length scales. It will clearly not be the right picture if you're looking at asymptotic long time dynamics, uh, but it may be sensible in that regime. And then we can take sort of the opposite limit where we think that the spinons are instantaneously in equilibrium um, given a, a pi flux background, but then the pi flux uh, or the Vison background is able to respond either via H prime or thermal fluctuations, but anyway, in an incoherent manner, and therefore it, they're able to move stochastically. Uh, and every time they change configuration, the, uh, the spinons are remaining in their instantaneous ground state. It's essentially a born open event type picture. And this allows us, this, this is more consistent with, with the long time dynamics in an approximate uh, manner. And so we can look at these two limits to see uh, what kind of physics um, we observe uh, in this system. Um, I will keep monitoring the, the, the chat. Sometimes it doesn't update and I see the questions a little later. So um, maybe I keep scrolling on it. But if you have questions, please do continue to ask. It's actually very useful. Um, okay. Um, so static Vison approximation as a first point, and this essentially reduces the problem to something that um, people have been studying for some time already. Um, yet, actually, Oli was able to make some progress on this, which I was very impressed about. So I, I'm going to discuss it, even if it's essentially uh, an older problem. Um, so we have a fixed Vison configuration, therefore a fixed uh, um, pattern of uh, pi fluxes on the lattice and a spin on uh, that moves along it, and we want to compute um, some dynamical properties, um, say the behavior of uh, the position, um, the variance of the position of the spin on as a function of time to look at diffusive versus uh, subdiffusive behavior or pro ballistic propagation, et cetera. Typical quantities we want to compute are, say, the probability P here, 
of a spinon being created at site R, propagated with the Hamiltonian in time T, annihilated at site S. And because the pi flux is, uh, background is fixed, we might as well uh, bracket this with a fixed pi flux configuration, compute the quantities we want, and then average over the different pi flux configuration. We need to do an ensemble average because they are part of the degrees of freedom of the system. They are not disorder imposed from outside. Um, so typically, if we then, uh, for those who are familiar with others, maybe mm, you can intuitively understand and follow anyway, uh, this type of um, expectation values uh, typically involve um, looking at possible trajectories that in time t take a spin on from site R to S and back because it's absolute value squared. So we are looking at closed loops between R and S. And um, there are generally two types of paths that will be important in the following discussions. There will be paths R to S to R uh, similar to the one on the bottom left hand side of the panel uh, in this slide which ramify as much as you like, but they always self-retrace. Wherever a particle goes, comes back, and there is never any area enclosed. And these paths essentially uh, ignore the, 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 the pi flux background. Um, on the other hand, uh, you can have other trajectories, and an overly simplified one is the one on the right-hand side uh, at the bottom part of the slide, where the two trajectories R, S, S, R enclose an area. If they enclose an area, when you average over um, Vison configuration, you will average over the probabilities of having pi fluxes inside or not of this area. And this typically leads to some interference that we uh, expect. The pi flux uh, case is special. Uh, it's first of all, time reversal symmetric, which is rather unique, but also it means that if your loops that surround an area were to wind twice, for instance, they will also become insensitive to the uh, flux enclosed because it becomes always a multiple of two pi. However, generally speaking, you can have this intuitive picture in your head uh, that if you are enclosing an area, there will be some interference. And when you average over Vison configurations, this will reduce the weight of this path with respect to the self-retracing ones. This remains a very hard problem, but we can take a brutal approximation and say, what if we focus only on the self-retracing paths? No, so we, we take the favoring to an extreme limit and we completely ignore paths that, um, that enclose an area. It's of course brutal, it's not um, what the system does, but it's one case where we can do some analytics as opposed to doing numerics, which with, even with symplectic integration uh, limits our system size and time scales uh, uh, quite uh, substantially. If we focus only on self-retracing path, there is an interesting um, uh, analytical uh, treatment that actually allows you to take, um, so all the paths from R to S that always, that do not enclose any area and uh, map them onto walks on a beta lattice because you can take the uh, square uh, uh, lattice and then trace all the paths that now become independent into a beta construction uh, of, uh, of uh, connectivity four. Um, I don't have the time to go into these details. That's um, the reference of the archive. And this is actually uh, the, the beautiful technical work that Oli did um, in really producing outstanding results and an exact solution on the beta lattice uh, that, um, um, well, it's unprecedented in the sense that uh, even people working on this problem in 2017 didn't uh, uh, dare going through the full calculation. Um, what distribution of visor configurations you take? Um, yes, so at this point in time, um, we are uh, taking an ensemble average over all Vison configurations. And in this, uh, for these specific calculations, we assume that they are at infinite temperature. So delta bar is so small compared to temperature that there isn't really, uh, there are probability a half essentially. Um, later on, th this is not a crucial uh, importance. You can actually account for the chemical potential. Um, Later on, I'll give a formula where that actually matters, but it will be a couple of slides down the line. Okay, so what do we find? Well, beta lattice calculation is solvable and it gives you quantum diffusion. Uh, quantum diffusion means that you are actually still a quantum mechanical, uh, solving a quantum mechanical problem, but the lack of interference uh, because of self-retracing actually tells you that the scaling of R square uh, 
as a function of time is linear rather than quadratic. This is a log-log scale. Uh, the beta is the dashed uh, green line uh, that you see is the top curve in the figure. And there are a few curves overlapped, so you may not be able to see it very well as a dashed green line, but the top one is the beta solution. Uh, in log-log scale, what happens is that you start off quadratic, which is ballistic. This is expected if the motion is shorter than the typical distance between bisons, you don't see any bisons. And so that is the um, uh, square behavior. And then you have a crossover as soon as you hit the typical separation uh, and it becomes linear. So R squares goes a linear in time. We know that this is an artifact of the beta calculation. Um, why? Because the um, eigenstates of the random flux problem uh, are localized and therefore they cannot support quantum diffusion. Exactly. So that is the problem. You should, we should see localization. And this is exactly the point where I was saying uh, effective models are needed and, and beta lattice doesn't quite cut it. Uh, I'll say a moment we have done actually numerics. And um, so overlap to the uh, beta calculation, there is um, the um, solution numerically with using symplectic integration of the full problem, which is uh, um, average over random Bison configurations of the tight binding model. Um, the case of pi fluxes is uh, the Z2 curve, which is, oops, it's the blue one, which is the bottom one in the plot. And the signature of weak localization that you see is the departure from uh, diffusion. But interestingly, with the large system sizes and, and large uh, time scales that are accessible with symplectic integration, uh, the behavior of the um, blue curve remain quite linear. And so if you took it, without knowing what the system is, you would actually think that it's actually subdiffusive behavior. Again, it's not consistent with localization. The blue curve has to eventually plateau because the states are localized, uh, but it does so on incredibly long uh, uh, timescales. But we see that immediately already at, uh, at very short times, it departs from uh, diffusion. It means that there are some states that are importantly localized uh, even at short distance with the pi flux. Very interestingly, what happens if we break the pi flux, which is the time reversal invariant as, as a curiosity, and we put two pi over three fluxes, for instance, uh, or pi over two fluxes? Um, I'll come back to that question in a second. And that's represented by the Z3 case, Z4, or we can put even continuous fluxes. And it's remarkable that over these time scales, they overlap exquisitely uh, with the beta solution. So it means that those states are so weakly localized that the system is really just um, uh, uh, quantum diffusing for a long time before it realizes, oops, there is actually a localization length and it should uh, tail off and plateau. Um, there is a, some in intuitive picture for that, but we will, uh, I, I will have to skip it because I want to get to uh, uh, um, another property that I find a lot more exciting than this. This is some senses, uh, some redigested understanding of, of, of uh, largely some existing literature. Um, let me catch up on the questions one second. So um, the form of disorder seems to be quite different from white noise disorder in hopping. Perhaps this is why good physics uh, seems to be absent. Uh, um, I think so I'm not very familiar what would happen in presence of white noise, but I think you're on the right track. Uh, here, uh, you would have to access incredibly long times and uh, 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 large distances to see uh, gather time physics. Uh, and at least that's, that's, that's our understanding. Um, maybe with white noise, and this is, I'm not familiar with the literature, I'm sorry, maybe white noise you already see at these timescales, but, um, but in our case, um, in, in these systems, it it's, seems to be absent as you're right. It's actually, we know it has to be there, but it's not um, visible or accessible numerically. And unfortunately, beta, beta calculation doesn't have it. So, so there, it's, you can go to infinite times, but it doesn't do. Uh, I didn't even understand uh, whether we should think of the center of the band or not. This is a kind of problem. Um, 
So you don't you, you don't need to cent think about the center of the band because the center of the band has a localization length that is so large that we just don't see its physics here essentially. So we are very much looking at the uh, edges of the energy spectrum where the, the localization length is shortest. And the point is that it's just about short enough to make a difference for the Z2 case and for Z3, Z4 and U1, it doesn't make a difference. Yeah. I hope that sort of addresses the question. I'm also wary of time, so I would like to uh, um, move ahead. And then if you have more questions, please do keep asking. I hope that sort of addressed the uh, ones there. Um, this is in some sense old, re revisiting old physics. The newest part here is this beta solution, which is Im impressive to me, uh, um, and a few other considerations. Um, but it's, it's a long-standing problem where understanding it beyond this level is very, very much challenging. But this is also the limit which makes our system uh, most similar to a um, external disorder in the sense that we made the pi fluxes static and therefore we took them out of the system as and, and did and not looked at them as, as degrees of freedoms of the system itself but we looked at them in some sense as, as standalone static uh, um, background uh, and I find more interesting actually to look at the other limit uh, where we can think about thermodynamic behavior where uh, the spinons are instantaneously in equilibrium. And so um, every, for every bison configuration, uh, you're going to have a ground state energy for the spinons that is compatible with it. And now then you can you do Monte Carlo on the bisons, so stochastic motion, creation, annihilation events. And this is subject to their chemical potential, which is delta bar, but also uh, the spin on energy itself, um, because if they stay in the ground state, this ground state energy changes as you change the bison configuration. And, and, and therefore, through the mutual statistics, these spinons endow the bisons uh, with an energy term that is non-trivial. And so if we run simulation, in this case, what you can do is run a Monte Carlo of the, uh, of the bisons, and for every bison configuration, you do um, a, a ED on the spin on, say, a single spin on problem to begin with. And then you keep updating the bison according to the typical metropolis rules using the spin on ground state energy and the, the, the bison chemical potential and temperature, of course. And what we see uh, is shown as a snapshot uh, in figure A, uh, the left panel. Um, the gray squares are the positions of the bisons. And um, you see that there is a big patch, the, the dashed lines are guide to the eye. Uh, the, uh, there is a big patch in the middle of the system um, that where, where the bisons have all been expelled. And correspondingly, if we look at the, in ED, we look at the absolute value squared of the spin on wave function, we see that it's concentrated, this is the right hand panel, is concentrated precisely in the center of that patch. What is happening is actually quite intuitive. Uh, the spinons have a tight binding amplitude, and so they can minimize their, minimize their energy the more they can tight bind freely across the system. But when you have bisons, they become localized, and that kills their kinetic energy. Therefore, the spinons would like to get rid of all the bisons. There is a temperature, and therefore entropy, that wants to populate the system uniformly and randomly with bisons. The competition between the two uh, does the best it can by generating a surface tension. And very nearly circular bubbles uh, where the uh, spinons are uh, now confined. Uh, uh, yes, that's exactly true. The bison energy functionally is not local. Uh, you have to solve the full uh, uh, ED problem. Um, and, uh, and that, of course, limits the system sizes that we can run and also makes it very difficult to run uh, um, simulations with uh, a high density of, of uh, uh, finite density of, uh, of spin-ons. Um, it, it, it is an intrinsic uh, issue. We tried to see if we could convert uh, this ground state energy into a sort of a two-body interaction between the bisons, but we could not find a, a viable way to do so in an effective manner. And um, that's best we could, but we have an intuitive picture that is at the bottom of this slide that maybe will give a, a different answer um, to your question, Sam. And the intuitive picture is that 
at least at the level of a single spin on, we can argue that this competition can be embodied in a, in a relatively simple free energy where we think of, okay, the expelled region has a diameter Xi. Well, there are two length scales. Xi is its diameter, Xi naught, uh, or Xi naught is the uh, penetration depth. So the diameter, there are no, no bisons, and of course, that's just uh, spin on is happy to tightly bind around. And then the penetration depth is when the wave function, spin on wave function, enters the bison populated region and it gets suppressed exponentially by localization. Um, so the free energy is precisely a combination of uh, this kinetic energy of the spin on in this region. Uh, it's J naught squared, it's proportional to H, the hopping amplitude. J naught squared is essentially the, the zero of the um, uh, uh, Bessel function of first order divided by Xi plus Xi naught. So this whole term, the whole first term in the, in the free energy is effectively the ground state energy of a quantum dot of size Xi plus Xi. Xi plus Xi naught diameter. And then we have the fact that um, temperature, or well, we have actually T times minus T, Ts, the typical entropic contribution to a free, uh, a free energy, where the entropy comes from the fact that everywhere in the system, the spinons are populated, uh, sorry, bisons are populated thermally. They have an, ex, an energy delta bar and temperature, inverse temperature beta. So one plus e to the minus beta delta bar is essentially the uh, um, uh, uh, free energy, so the entropy of the uh, Bison configuration uh, uh, in presence of this sole chemical potential. Uh, and then we have to account for the fact that that energy, that the entropy does not contribute in the patch that where the Bisons have been excluded. And that's why there is a contribution of psi square outside and of course proportional to temperature and the others are just factors. So intuitively, we can understand that as the competition between the uh, ground state energy of the spinon localized in this uh, self-generated dot and the entropy of the bisons around it. Notice that around it, the spinon wave functions decays to zero very quickly. And so around it, the bisons are truly just non-interacting because the spinon is not there and the bison in this simple model have no interactions uh, uh, between them. Um, Given this very simple effective free energy, we can then minimize with respect to Xi, and that uh, uh, gives, uh, gives us the equilibrium values Xi star as a function of temperature for these bubbles. Um, we can compare them to numerical simulation of the Monte Carlo uh, type mentioned earlier. And this is done in the left top left panel here. Um, so the blue curve is referred to the axis on the, vert, uh, on the left, and it's the uh, NP is the bison density. And um, of course, there is a lot more physics uh, in the behavior of the simulations, but the dashed line is the solution of that very simple free energy. Uh, and, and the agreement is quite remarkable considering how simple uh, that is. It ignores any roughness of the, of the um, uh, disk, et cetera. Similarly, you can compute uh, Xi, uh, the average value of Xi, um, or typically average of Xi square under square root. Uh, the red uh, uh, dots are the simulations with the axis on the right hand side. And again, the dashed line is the solution of the free energy. So remarkably in, in, in decent agreement. So it seems that we actually have the correct physical picture of what is uh, going on. Um, this is really, an effect of the mutual statistics between the uh, spinons and the visons, in the sense that the only reason why the kinetic energy of the spinons endows the visons with an energy that forms this patch is because the mutual statistics interferes with the kinetic energy gain of the spinons hopping around. So the observation of any physical properties that are related to the presence of these depleted patches is really a signature of the core feature of a quantum spin liquid, the mutual statistics between its anionic excitations. Now, if someone in the audience, particularly our referee, for instance, <laughs> um, wanted to play devil's advocate, of course, could say, we took a very, very simplified model uh, where there are no interactions whatsoever. Now, if we were to switch off the mutual statistics, and turn on interactions between the spinons and the visons, 
Now, this mo the model is no longer topological. You've lost a lot of the interest, but you still expect localization uh, because the fixed, um, the, the, the stochastic visons would act uh, uh, as localizers uh, or would introduce some localization to the tight binding spinons. That is true, but the beauty of the system and the robustness is, is, is lies in the peculiarity of the pi fluxes and their time reversal invariant. Um, they localize on time scale, on, on length scales that are uh, exceptionally short compared to a typical interaction energy scale. This is shown in the right hand side. What we did is run the same simulation, switch off the uh, statistics and turn on a sensible energy scale on site interaction between the spinon and bisons. We do get localization. Uh, the kinetic energy of the spinons feeds back into the energy of the visons. But what happens is that this localization length psi naught is actually much bigger than psi. And so rather than seeing a patch, what we see is a very smooth modulation of the bison density. As a matter of fact, on the lattice sizes that we can simulate, this is so smooth that it's essentially uniform. And so that translates into a uniform shift of the chemical potential for the visons. Um, instead of a, a, a nice patch or depletion, what we have is, is, is a uniform change in the density. So the bison correlation is uniform across. It doesn't have any particular features and it's shown in the top right uh, small inset panel here. And uh, correspondingly, if we plot the density as a function of temperature is the blue curve here and overlapped almost perfectly with it. So the point to the point that you really can't see it uh, is the solution with a, with a modified chemical potential for the visons. So we have a very different physics going on. If on this model, exactly the same simulations, we turn on the uh, statistics, you get the red curve here, and you get the bottom right small panel. So immediately the patches come back because psi naught now is controlled by the mutual statistics uh, of the pi flux type behavior. Uh, it creates this depletion region and it gives you a dependence of the bison density on temperature, which is qualitatively different from a change in chemical potential overall. Um, so it's really truly a signature of these uh, anionic excitations. So I'm aware that um, um, I'm coming to uh, the end of the time. Uh, so I have a, essentially, in principle, a couple of slides where I could close with this. Um, and then if we want uh, some points about the other model, uh, we can discuss if there is time for that or not, but I maybe take questions beforehand. Uh, but the two slides I want to cover is what type of um, uh, uh, physics, uh, interesting physics can we get from this behavior? So far, I've essentially discussed the single spinon picture. Um, and one regime that we think is particularly uh, interesting uh, when you have this effective phase separation where spinons dig their own holes in, in, in bisons and then they become confined to it with their wave function tailing out of them only exponentially small, uh, suppressed, uh, is the following. Imagine that you can um, keep thermodynamic equilibrium and you measure the density of spinons in this case. Well, they have a chemical potential. Delta is the largest energy scale in the system. And so the type of behavior we expect is an exponential minus delta over T to a large extent. That's the dashed blue line here. Now imagine that we prepare the system in equilibrium at temperature T1. What we are gonna be in is we're gonna have some density of, bison, of spinons, sorry, each of which is typically randomly placed and isolated in, in its own patch. And these patches, one can check back of the envelope calculation, have uh, radii that are, uh, or diameters that are much smaller than their typical separation. Now imagine that we sweep uh, the temperature uh, at a constant rate and we decrease it. Well, the system would like to respond and relax. And in order to relax the spinon energy, you would like the spinons to meet one another and annihilate. However, in order to remove spinons, they have to meet pairwise. Their wave functions are exist or are non-vanishing only within their res res respective patches. And if these are well separated from one another, the time scale for this annihilation is for the whole patch to move and meet 
uh, another. When they touch, they can annihilate. The point is that the motion of a patch is actually a coordinated motion or annihilation creation events that of all the visons around that act as a fluid in order to allow it to move across. So it's uh, be reasonable to expect this type of motion to be quite slow. So if you sweep faster than these characteristic time scales, uh, the spin-ons will be more or less static. And even if you're lowering the temperature of the system, they will not be able to evaporate because they can't meet one another and annihilate. Uh, therefore, their spin-on density remains constant and you keep driving the system, say, from T1 towards T2. Annihilation creation doesn't conserve energy indeed. So that's why if you lower the temperature, the system wants to remain in equilibrium and wants to annihilate bisons to lower the energy correspondingly. Um, as you lower the temperature, the bisons is true they can't move. However, there is one quick response they have. Their patches, which are a balance between kinetic energy and entropy, will change their diameters. And that is a fast response because all it takes is for bisons around them to annihilate or create. So what you have is as you move from T1 to T2 is that the, the, the bison patches will become bigger and bigger. And clearly this will end at T2, will end when the bison's patches start touching one another. At that point, they touch and they can annihilate, they can reduce the density. And so if you keep sweeping temperature down, now you get into a that kin kinematically locked regime where you continue to expand the bubbles, they touch, they annihilate, new bubbles touch and annihilate they keep, as they keep expanding. And so you, you continue to keep the system at this threshold where the typical diameter of a bubble is approximately the typical separation between two, the centers of two bubbles. And that is the, again, something we can compute from the um, uh, uh, phenomenological free energy model that I mentioned earlier, and that's the dashed uh, line, which is actually a, a t to the fourth behavior. So we, we switch from, from an exponential in the blue line to, to a power law, and then you keep moving along that if you keep sweeping uh, uh, temperature down, and say you go from t2 to t3. Now imagine you start increasing the temperature again from t3, you are in a situation that is artificially high in spin-on density and the bubbles are just touching. You increase temperature, entropy wins, the, the bubbles shrink, so they separate from one another, they decouple, so nothing happens anymore to their density. And because they are overpopulated, they don't get created either. So you're gonna have a plateau again on the spin-on density from T3 to T4. This behavior will stop only when temperature is so large that your stuck, well, the, your, your density of stuck spin-ons becomes smaller than the equilibrium one, and then you start generating new, one, new pairs, et cetera, and so you go from T, T4 to T1. And so this is a, a pretty interesting out of equilibrium regime and, um, and these plateaus of uh, uh, increasing, decreasing patches with, with slow motion that could have several experimental signatures uh, clearly in transport properties, in susceptibility, et cetera. And you don't have to go around the full cycle, but even exploring just uh, the different plateaus would possibly give, to, um, uh, give rise to very specific signatures. That's our hope. And these signatures, as I argued in the previous slide, are direct evidence of, of mutual uh, statistics and therefore of quantum spin liquid behavior uh, that would appear in the system if it were equilibrated all the way down to uh, uh, low tem temperatures below delta bar. Okay, um, I, will I will skip for the time being the six vertex and come to conclusions, take questions, and then we want to, we, you can tell me if we want to say a few words about the six vertex or not. Um, and so just to summarize before I take all questions is that we discussed one class of models out of the two, uh, but I tried to make the case that there is uh, um, an interesting, well, we studied the dynamic and thermodynamic properties of intermediate, uh, this intermediate temperature regime in, in a class of quantum spin liquids, those characterized by this dominant classical projective energy scale. And I highlighted a range of behaviors that I find quite interesting and exciting from um, pretend subdiffusive propagation, in de facto is disorder-free localization, uh, and then 
um, this statistics driven phase separation uh, that gives rise to this very uh, unusual out of equilibrium behavior. And then um, in the six vertex model, you will get also compact uh, uh, localized states and scars, but that's uh, I didn't talk about. Um, many of these behaviors we think um, have uh, potential for interesting experimental signatures in transport or response properties, and they would be the earliest signatures of the underpinning quantum spin liquid behavior at very low temperature or zero temperature uh, that may be observable uh, in experiments that would make this um, inter temperature in intermediate temperature regime uh, not only interesting per se, but potentially very powerful in the diagnostics and characterization of uh, candidate quantum spin liquid Hamiltonians and materials. Um, I discussed one simple case study. There is another that we studied in the other two papers outlined here. Uh, and I tried to paint a coherent picture thereof. Um, of course, we are still far away from uh, having a general framework, which would be uh, the um, outcome in the end, desir most desirable outcome in the end. But uh, that will take more work and looking forward to it, actually. Um, I, I think I would take questions now and then we can touch upon the six vertex if there is an appetite for it. Okay, yeah, let's uh, thank Claudio for now and uh, start with questions. So there is a question from Stephen Blundell uh, yeah. in the chat. A great talk, Claudio. Can you say a bit about which experimental systems you think would, be, would best realize this kind of spin-on vison behavior. Um, that's yeah. That is um, it's an interesting question. Um, the spin-on vison behavior relies on um, Z two type uh, gauge theories in, in quantum spin liquids, which are the ones where we have um, not too many experimental realizations at hand. Uh, but it was the simplest to sort of set the stage for and talk about. The six vertex, which is related to quantum spin eyes, would have had uh, more of an experimental angle, but um, I chose to order them that way. And so apologize for, apologies for that. Uh, but nonetheless, there are also experimental indications of this. Well, um, on the one hand, uh, there is a Z2 phase in um, candidate Kitaev uh, systems. Um, and uh, it's slightly pathological because it requires, so candida Kitaev systems are systems in three-fold coordinated lattices with Jx, Jy, Jz type of interactions. There are some interesting ruthenates and other materials uh, that have been investigated uh, in this direction that look promising. Um, what you need in order to send them uh, a more Z2 type like character is to actually make one of the interaction bonds uh, stronger than the other. Uh, but this is perhaps not too uh, unrealistic because we know how to apply uniaxial pressure either mechanically or sometimes chemically. So maybe once we have a, a good candidate uh, uh, Kitaev uh, material, uh, thinking about how to squish it in one direction, thus making one of the exchange couplings much stronger than the other two, it wouldn't be uh, too far-fetched. Um, there are some cold atomic systems uh, that uh, are, have been designed and proposed to, um, uh, to realize these systems. Um, and then there are um, slightly less clear, but there are some interesting um, uh, orbital compass models, which are not quite Z2 theories, but perhaps some of the physics uh, applies there. And this is um, something, some work to be done on a theoretical front to see. Uh, if, if it's a sensible direction of investigation or not. Um, if we abandon Z2 and discuss the six vertex model, then uh, Kitai, uh, sorry, uh, spin ice like materials are very typical in this picture. You have this large energy scale that forces the two in, two out, and then some quantum fluctuations that make them uh, um, uh, hop and generate ring exchange. And then you have all of the um, um, uh, irid, uh, not iridate, um, the presodymium uh, 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 family, for instance, um, where one can hope um, to see some of this behavior. Um, Andrew? Yeah, so, yeah. so just to repeat, Sam just said uh, you can ask questions by using uh, the raise hand option, uh, which Andrew yeah, just Andrew did. Raise the hand. 
Hi, Claudio. Great talk. Um, I, I had a question. You mentioned the connection to a whole range of phenomena such as many body scars, disorder-free localization, and also things like Hilbert space fragmentation and so on. But the, the message from MBL seemed to be that disorder-free localization only really occurs for singular interactions, singular in one way or another. And the story was probably more like a disentangled liquid if you don't have that sort of singular interaction. But mm -hmm. Which do you think holds here? Is it this disentangled liquid story of Grover Fisher or is it something that really has localization? Um, I, so I, I, it, it's 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 Grover. So it, yeah, it depends a little bit on on if you're asking a pragmatic question or or or, or a matter of principle. Matter of principle, I agree. Um, the moment that the, the disorder is self-generated and is part of the degrees of freedom, then eventually uh, we'll have some dynamics of some sort. So it's 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 many body localized only if you fine tune the system not to have any dynamics in that respect. Okay. Of course, if you're now talking about a pragmatic experimental measurement, um, the fact that, say, the background bisons maybe move on relatively lethargic timescales means that you still observe localization physics. Uh, it, it will melt at infinite times, but you, you don't measure for infinite times. And, and that, there are no measurable distinction between the two, I guess. Uh, in experimentally, no. Um, if you're talking about quantum Hamiltonians, then I absolutely agree that uh, if you want, uh, if you can solve it, uh, self-generated disorder will will in, eventually um, uh, uh, melt if you allow for generic perturbations. Thank you. Thanks. So the next question is from Christian Chung. Uh, hi, thanks for the great talk. So I'm personally interested in the um, six vertex aspects of this because uh, I work with Michelle Gingra, a PhD student, and uh, you know we're interested in more of quantum spin ice stuff. So maybe since it doesn't seem like there's a lot of questions, if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to, to give uh, two, three or five minutes. I'm asking the organizers. There is another question I could take first. If you, if, um, Frank, what do you think? Um, we have another session coming up at six, uh, and uh, I don't know how, how much energy there is left in, in members of the audience, but um, yeah, I mean, what, what are other people's views? I think it's better to take remaining questions about the eight vertex model than if you want to say 30 seconds about this or something of things that are similar. Yeah, yeah. It's not really time to say anything substantial okay then then let's uh let's take jennifer reed's question um a bit of a related question actually um i'm wondering um, if you can say anything about the presence of dispersionless excitations would they be expected in the six vertex model but not the eight vertex model uh yes um so exactly. So that those dispersion is as in, for instance, scars of or, or compact localized states. Um, so I can I can give a, a thirty seconds that I perhaps is is will such will give some answers to both Christian and Jennifer. Um, I mean the, the point is that when you go to six vertex, the the key point is that the Hamiltonian is no longer made of commuting terms. And so we have our beloved delta defects that we can understand as hopping terms. And those are the monopoles in spin eyes for those who are familiar, but it's not important. Consider them equally as the um, defects in the eight vertex model, but we cannot understand the background very well at the lattice level. So the best thing we can do in terms of this intermediate uh, regime is actually to assume that the spins as an effective approximation the spins are a static background uh, and the uh, monopoles or, or the uh, excitations, let's call them spin-ons again, uh, are hopping around coherently. As the spin-ons hop, they flip this, uh, the spins underlying. Um, and the point is that if the spins underlying are classical, now we are taking an ensemble average over all possible spin background configurations. For each of them, um, they impose 
constraints on how you can move. And so even if you start with a square lattice and one excitation, this excitation is actually not free to move across the lattice, but it's only free to move across a subsection of the lattice, the lattice that is controlled by the background spins. And so we reduce the problem from a lattice question to a random regular graph, if you want. And um, this leads to some interesting points about localization. And I will refer to the reference for this because it's more elaborate than I can go into with my 30 plus seconds. Uh, but what I want to point out is that you can break down the model in the simplest possible form by thinking of a linear chain of where the spins uh, move along or the monopoles move along the chain. And it has linear offshoots of random lengths. And this is, this is known as the random comb model. And something that is very interesting about this is the motion of, along the backbone can be mapped onto Anderson localization, but with one peculiarity that the Anderson localizing energy W actually has divergences at special patterns of these offshoots. For example, if you have three offshoots that follow one another at length two, one, two, then you get a divergence of WX and this divergence corresponds to a state that is ultra localized on the site of the backbone in the middle of this pattern. Oh, these are, of course, a handful of flat bands shown here uh, pictorially. Well, this is the dispersion uh, that give rise to spikes in the density of states. And these spikes are, in, spikes are indeed observed uh, in um, brute force uh, ED for monopoles hopping uh, in quantum square eyes, for instance. And so we believe that these actually play a role. And these are states that are dispersionless. They are ultra localized due to a special pattern in configuration space uh, that, that uh, uh, makes their wave functions non-vanishing essentially, well, in this specific case, only on one side. Uh, so these are obviously like essentially scar states. They don't have area law. Uh, uh, they have area, area law entanglement. Uh, because they, they just trivially don't have support. They have very ultra localized support uh, in, um, in space. Uh, and so this is a favor of the type of physics. And of course, this type of localized phase affects spin on conductivity. So you get spike behavior and so on. And, and you can get some diagnostics in the uh, magnetization dynamics, for instance, for this system. These are just flavors. And I would then refer to the archives or anything more than that. As one more question that popped up from Jorge, if there is time. Yes. Hi, Claudio. Lovely talk. Unfortunately, I, be, I, I missed a chunk because of an RAF committee meeting. So I hope I, my question is not about something you actually said during that little bit. Uh, anyway, I was going to ask about the backbone model. Um, if you imagine having one of these paths that wandered off and connecting it to another, then it becomes a model that several people looked at for localization on small world networks some 10, 15 years ago. Efitov had something, uh, I wrote something with Vivaldo Campo. And I just wondered, there was localization there as well, and there's also interference under some type effects. Do you think yeah. this is fundamentally different or could there be connections with those? No, they're, they're very, very yeah. similar. It's just that in terms of, taking an ultra simplified local picture of the system, we didn't have particular reasons to connect the legs. So we took them linear sticking out. Um, it turns out there is a huge classical literature on the random com model and there wasn't a, a, much of a quantum literature. So we just wanted to fill that gap. We, but by the, 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 cons, the concept of contrarialized states and that type of physics, it's shared between these models in, in many different features. Did you look at the um, fractal structure of the wave functions? Because in uh, those cases, they were multifractal, so they had different power laws for different moments. Uh, we get, oh, I don't have this slide, but we, we get multifractal structure when we look at actually quantum tight binding in quantum square eyes, uh, as indicated right. by the, all the Q um, uh, inverse partification, in Q powers of the inverse partification mm, participation ratio. Um, this is only shown as the standard IPR, but if you look at all the Q moments, you do see something that indicates multifractal behavior. But um, we are working with the uh, ED on relatively small systems, so we don't feel like comfortable making a, a um, serious claim about it. Thank you. Very interesting. Thank you. <laughs>
So yeah, um, in view of time, I think uh, we should uh, end the, the session here and uh, thank Claudio again for a great talk and answering a lot of questions. And yeah, let's just try to set up uh, another seminar where Claudio can talk about uh, the second part uh, of the story and send around uh, a link to the seminar. Okay, let's uh, thank Claudio again. Okay, so my suggestion is to have a five minute break uh, that everybody can uh, get something to drink or eat or do other things. And uh, yeah, let's uh, meet again in five minutes. So what time, what time precisely? At six, at six, just after six then? Yeah, let's yeah, say six, six, six or five. Six or yeah. five. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Oh, Claudio, are you still there? Yes, I am. Uh, could you stop uh, screen sharing? Uh, oh, good thanks. point.